Who am I? Don't worry, I'm not having some sort of existential crisis. I just thought I'd answer the question for you, the viewer. I'm not AI, although that is definitely exactly something AI would say. And I'm not Tom either. I'm Jack. I've been working behind the scenes on the Watchfinder channel for some time now. You may have even spotted my hands, so I thought I'd introduce myself. And what better way to do that than by showing you some watches from my personal collection. If you're looking to buy, sell or exchange a luxury watch, visit Watchfinder. This handsome little 33mm Tissot was my first decent watch, given to me by my dad as I left school. The manual wind movement, although from the 50s and 60s, like the rest of the watch, kept good time and I credit winding life into this watch every day or so as one of the things that got me hooked on mechanical wristwatches. I still wear it too. It's a characterful little watch that wears its age like a badge of honour. Fast forward to a few years after I was given the camping. On holiday in Cornwall, I spotted a sporty 70s style Quartz Tissot while looking around a vintage market. I really liked the look of it. It was just £50, so I bought it. If that were the end of the story, that would be great but I soon found out why it was only £50. After taking the watch to a jeweller in the family to get a new battery, we discovered that some parts of the watch were in fact Tissot, but from at least three different watches. I'd bought a Franken watch and I keep it in my collection as a reminder to do my research and only buy from reliable sources. After seeing the Timex Q Timex, I thought that would make a great little runabout watch one that I didn't have to worry about too much, thanks to its affordable price. Then I tried one on. Although I still enjoyed the look of the watch, my level of arm hair didn't agree with the bracelet. So when the GMT version was announced, with a different style bracelet, I pulled the trigger and haven't looked back. Watch lovers, I have something to confess. I didn't actually have a Seiko in my collection until earlier this year when a certain Seiko-obsessed pair of talking hands gifted it to me for his departure. While I've always wanted a sporty Seiko in my collection, I've been hesitant to purchase as my wrists fall on the smaller side. Boy was I wrong, this deep blue Seiko 5 Sports might be slightly larger than most of the watches I own, but on this NATO strap, it fits on my wrist better than I could have ever imagined. Like every other person on earth, I had an F91W growing up, but that's unfortunately been lost to a box somewhere in my loft. However, to be a true watch collector, you have to have some sort of Casio, right? Well, that leads us to this, my G-Shock. I know what you're thinking, whoa, that thing looks like it's been run over by a tank, and you'd be right. Walking through duty free, on the way back from holiday, this caught my eye, the Hamilton Jazzmaster Viewmatic Skeleton. It's a 40mm stainless steel watch that offers incredible value for money, especially with it now being available for around £500 pre-owned. Not only is it skeletonized in all the right places, offering a view of the components driving its hands, but it's also well built and boasts a 42 hour power reserve. It's the watch in my collection that spends the most time under a watchmaker's loop. A £500 tourbillon, need I say more? Wrist watches have been used as tools for as long as they've been around, helping aviators fly and sailors sail. My practical use for a tool watch, however, isn't as life or death. I bought this watch to help me track the time while swimming. And while that was its only intended purpose at the time, this £500 Baltic has now become one of the watches I wear the most. It's a great looking 39mm watch with 200m of water resistance and a screw down crown that's rugged, reliable and can handle anything I throw at it. A few years ago, I proposed in Gibraltar. Wanting to celebrate and mark the occasion, I bought this vintage Tudor from a small watch shop on Gibraltar's Main Street. I'm a sucker for a watch with history, and this Tudor Oyster with its patina dial stood out. I could have bought a Rolex Oyster Precision 
from the same period, although it would have cost at least double the Tudor's £1,000 asking price. But I thought this was more interesting. It's Rolex case, crown and bracelet nod to the early years of the Tudor brand, where its timepieces were essentially rebranded Rolex watches. But it's not all doom and gloom. While I did have to part ways with a few of my watches to free up some cash, I still had some left over to buy this. The Omega Speedmaster, first Omega in space. I always wanted a Speedmaster, but the 42mm sizing was just out of reach for my skinny wrists. Then, while filming an unboxing video, I first held the watch you see here, and I knew I had to have it. You might notice it looks a little different to the standard moon watch, and that's because it isn't one, modelled after a watch that came out before the Speedmaster was even NASA certified. The first Omega in space is a tribute to astronaut Wally Shearer's personal CK2998 Speedmaster that he wore during the Sigma 7 mission of the Mercury program in 1962. But it's not the rich history, the 39.7mm sizing, or the calibre 1861 that I like the most about this watch. That's all great, but the biggest sell here for me is the watch's versatility. It's an absolute strap monster. What do you think I should add to my collection next? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and if you'd like to support the channel, please visit Watchfinder at the link in our description.